Our Bible study today is on 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, uh, as you have given us your word through um, the Apostle Peter, uh, we thank you for this letter written to the Christians long ago who uh, were being persecuted as they were preparing for um, the attack on their faith. And Lord, the world hasn't changed much in over 2,000 years. We continue to, uh, to look to you for, um, for our lives. Uh, we thank you, Lord, that uh, even if we lose our life in this world, we shall save it for eternal life through Jesus Christ, who died and rose again. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. <coughs> okay, so here in chapter 4 of First Peter, um, we see uh, the Apostle Peter is uh, continuing his uh, description of, uh, of a holy life. So <coughs> uh, he uh, is giving, in the middle of his letter, you know, it's, it's only five chapters, so we're almost towards the end. He's uh, giving uh, practical uh, advice uh, about how the Christian faith reacts to different relationships. So earlier he had talked about relationships with authorities and, you know, masters and servants and uh, <coughs> submission of uh, wives to their husbands and <coughs> duty, the duties of husbands. So that was in, uh, back in chapter 2 and 3. <coughs> And then he talked about, um, you know, Jesus as our example and the conduct and view of the end times. And he, here is, uh, well, and, that, and that's what we're getting into now is, is uh, how do we live as we uh, prepare for Jesus' return? <coughs> now, I think that it's, it's pretty obvious that the early Christians, I mean, they had no idea how long it would be before Jesus would return. And so they thought he would return soon. <coughs> <coughs> and so they, uh, you know, Peter himself, you know, uh, he, Jesus had told him at the end of John's gospel, you know, what is it to you if I, uh, if, you know, if I return before, you know, John lit, uh, before John dies. So he thought that John, the apostle, might live to see Jesus' return. <coughs> but in fact, he, he didn't actually say that he would do that. He says, you know, it's not your issue or your problem, uh, Peter. Peter needed to focus on what God was going to call him to do which at the end of John's gospel, he said, you know, someone will lead you where you do not want to go. And he was talking about how he would be led to uh, a cross to die as well. So, and he, he was crucified under Nero, the, uh, the emperor's um, uh, condemnation of, against Christianity and was executed on a cross, but because he, he requested that he would uh, be crucified upside down because he says, you know, I'm not worthy to be crucified at, like my savior. So they did that. They crucified him upside down. And, and so sometimes the symbol for his crucifixion is like a, it's an X. And it wasn't like a cross, like an upright cross, because, because he was upside down. It was an X, and they just put his feet up in the air and his arms down below. <coughs> okay, so here in uh, chapter 4, it says, on uh, verse 1, Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude. Because he who has suffered in his body is done with sin. And so he's you know, referring to what he had talked about before, which in uh, ch the end of chapter 3 <coughs> was talking about waiting patiently, you know, that uh, during the time of Noah, the, you know, God was, um, was not slow to punishment, uh, but he was uh, being patient. You know, he saved uh, Noah and his family, but he did, you know, bring about judgment upon the world <coughs> for their sin. Uh, and so in the last verse just before this, he said, you know, Jesus had gone into heaven and was at the right hand of the Father with angels and authorities and power in submission to him. So then it goes on to say, therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, uh, arm yourselves also with the same attitude. <coughs> what was Christ's attitude when he suffered? You know, he did it willingly, right? I mean, he, he knew what was happening. He wasn't afraid to die. Although he didn't look forward to it. I mean, he, nobody in their right mind would want to suffer. So when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, you know, Father, if it's possible, may this cup pass from me, but not my will, but your will be done. So he, you know, he didn't look forward to that, but he did um, follow the will of the Father in order to, to suffer and to die. <coughs> so 
Jesus' attitude was uh, an attitude of love. He went to the cross to save us. He loved us. And so when w- and he's talking here about Christians who um, would also have to face suffering and persecution and eventually death. I mean, Peter himself, um, if this was probably written <coughs> in the early 60s, <coughs> let's say 62, then Peter died in 67. So that uh, 67 AD, so this, within five years of writing this letter, he was crucified, right? So he, he himself is, is, uh, is facing this type of suffering. So how would he face his suffering? You know, he wants to do it in the same way as Jesus, uh, because Jesus, uh, you know, didn't accuse the people who were killing him. He didn't get angry or want revenge. You know, he simply said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. <coughs> so Christians who were, who were persecuted and who are persecuted even today are called to have the same attitude as Christ. You know, we suffer in our bodies sometimes, uh, but, um, but this is not... Uh, a necessarily a bad thing because we can't be separated from God simply because our bodies die uh, because we uh, because of our soul will be saved and God promises a uh, glorified body through the resurrection <coughs> okay verse 2 says as a result <coughs> he does not live the rest of his earthly life for evil human desires but rather for the will of God so he's talking about how Jesus went you know, he suffered. <clears throat> he doesn't necessarily talk about the resurrection here, but it's the, the fact that, that when his body died, sin died with it, right? So Jesus took our sins upon himself, and he died, and those sins died as well. Uh, and so, he, he, you know, he uh, implies or he infer, uh, well, yeah, he implies the fact that Jesus has already been raised because he says, as a result, he does not live the rest of his earthly life. Well, here is, Uh, so I think the point is that um, you know Jesus' suffering um, was for the purpose, as if you look back in chapter 318, he says, For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit. So we talked about that last week. The, the, the fact that Jesus' physical death was... After he died, he was raised spiritually, so he was still alive after, um, after his uh, death on the cross. He was made alive by God the Father. So God blessed him with the resurrection as a way of uh, showing that he had accepted the, the um, atonement or the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. So that means that if he accepted it, that means sins were paid for, right? The debt was wiped out away. So we, we have freedom from the point uh, that Jesus was raised. Uh, and so he's comparing how, as Christ suffered, um, you know, that we will also have, uh, find suffering in our lives sometimes, and then God is the one who's going to, uh, to bless us. And so that blessing comes from the fact that Jesus' resurrection is also our resurrection. So we also will have, we, and the Bible talks about the two resurrections. There's the spiritual resurrection, which is when you come to faith in Jesus Christ. Remember it says, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. And then John 3 talks about um, that if you are born of water and the Spirit, you know, then, then you have salvation. So uh, ha- through our baptism, uh, it's like our spirit that's dead in sin be- is made alive. So the first resurrection. So the second resurrection, Paul says, is the bodily resurrection that happens when Jesus returns and he you know, raises everybody from the dead and then he separates the sheep from the goats. Right? So Matthew 25 is the description of the of the final judgment and the, the physical resurrection. So the spiritual resurrection is our spirits are raised through faith. Yeah, because uh, not because Jesus died for our sins, we are free. Exactly. So because the, if we sin again, that... It's not counted against us, right? So I mean, sinning, the, it, our sins are already paid for, but we're still in a sinful world, so... So that, that has to do with, uh, with the difference between justification, which is where G- God has justified us, made us pure and holy. But sanctification is how do we live now as children of God, right? So you know, when you're born into a family, you still have to grow 
and mature as a um, part of that family to learn and stuff like that. Uh, so as Christians, we, um, we struggle with the sanctification part, but God doesn't kick us out of the family simply because we sin. Uh, if we choose to walk away from the family, that's different. Like the prodigal son left the family and he was, the father said he was dead and he was lost. But when he came back, he says, now you're, you're, he says to the older brother, he says, your brother who was lost but now is found, he was dead and now is alive. So that's what happens when we ask for forgiveness and we come back to the father and he accepts us with open arms. So God never, once we're made part of the family, the first resurrection, the spiritual resurrection, it is uh, something that is ours unless we reject it. So, but here he's t talking about Christians who, uh, who are dealing with the uh, Roman Empire's attacks. <clears throat> and, you know, Jesus, when he was, um, you know, being uh, put to death in the body, and it mentions about the rest of his earthly life, that he didn't use it for evil human desires, but rather the will of God. Uh, you know, that's an interesting phrase because, you know, after Jesus' suffering, the rest of his earthly life was just like ours right before he died on the cross. But he, he, even then, he didn't hurl insults or try to get revenge. You know, his words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, was an act of love. And that shows that even at the end of life, he didn't succumb to uh, worldly, earthly temptations. So verse 3, he's talking to the Christian uh, believer again. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans chose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. Uh, so, you know, we're wondering, who, who is he writing to? Because in the beginning of this letter, it sounds like he's talking, he's talking to Christians. He says, to God's elect, strangers in the world, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, etc. He, he and you can tell that this is after Paul's uh, missionary jur journeys because in the very early church, in the 40s, um, when James became the leader, Jesus' brother, became the leader of the church in Jerusalem, it was mostly cr uh, Christians were Jewish converts, believers in Jesus. So Peter is writing to people who included Gentiles because Paul had already brought a lot of Gentiles into the church. So when he says, you know, this is what your lives used to look like, that's your past, and because you believe in Jesus, your past is dead, right? And, but it doesn't mean that, you know, that, that, that those sins aren't a temptation. He's calling them to not live like they did in the past. And so the, the list here includes the kinds of things that were part of, of the Roman culture, right? Debauchery has to do with um, well, all these things fall under the category. Debauchery is just like, you know, um, it's kind of like evil uh, living, right? And then lust in particular, you know, is, uh, you know, looking at another person with a, um, treating them like, uh, like a thing rather than a person, right? So when you treat a, a somebody as a thing for your own purposes, that's what lust is. It's the sin is a selfish sin because it's, um, it's using people, right? And so that's what we find in, in our world today with a lot of uh, things that use that, use lust as the motivation, right? So you see, you know, um, sex trafficking, and prostitution, and pornography, those things uh, are against God's will because they treat others with, without love. They treat people like objects. And then, of course, drunkenness. <coughs> The Bible doesn't say that wine or alcohol in itself is evil, but drunkenness is yes, because, because it's a loss of, um, of your moral gu guidance. You know, you, you're, you, you're more susceptible to giving in to sin, your sinful nature. So God doesn't, you know, Paul says, do not be filled with spirits, but be filled with the spirit. Right? Don't be filled with wine, or, right. but be filled with the spirit of God. <coughs> And then orgies, of course, that, that was what the, um, the ancient religions were all about. You know, you would go to a temple to worship, but it was basically participating in cult prostitution. So, you know, even the 
the Canaanites did this, right? So Can you would go to the Temple of Baal, and so they, the Temple of Baal was a brothel, right, with prostitutes. And then they, they called them priestesses. And so the Greeks and the Romans did the same thing. They had the, the Temple of Aphrodite, the goddess of love, but in essence, the goddess of sex. That's what it was. And, and they, they had priestesses that would come down from the, the temple on the top of the mountain in, in certain cities like Athens and come down into the streets in the evenings and, and uh, invite uh, unsuspecting people, to, or men, mostly to come and to come back to the temple to participate in these orgies. And this was um, what they called uh, worship, the worship of the gods, you know. And so it was, uh, you know, God condemns these things because it goes against God's calling for husbands and wives to, um, uh, to treat each other with love in the image of God. So uh, when a man and a woman who are married come together uh, sexually, that is you know, a oneness that mirrors the oneness that God has with his people, that his intimacy with us is to be that close. But when a person commits adultery, then that's a type of idolatry, right? So idolatry is spiritual adultery. It's like giving yourself to another god that doesn't really exist. Like when you worship an idol, that's a type of, um, of adultery because it's spiritual. Um, adultery. So the orgies were something that uh, the pagans practiced, and God said, "You know, this is not uh, this is not right." And so Peter is reminding them, "You have been called out of this carousing. You know, is uh, has to do with uh, you know people uh, seeking after. Um, you know, I guess it's like you know, looking for." Uh, other people to you know to participate in sex right so people are, who are carousing are <coughs> basically uh, partying and doing things that are like predatory types of things where you're hurting other people and then uh, he find, he finishes off with detestable idolatry a lot of times we think of these um, all these like sins of in the body right drunkenness and adultery as one thing <coughs> and we think about adultery that's a different category but he's putting the two together, and the reason is because in the ancient world, they always were together. All the pagan religions participated in what we call the fertility cult. So the fertility cult was uh, the worship of the god to bring the rain and fertilize the earth by showing the gods what to do by participating in sex. So you're, because when uh, Baal would send rain to the earth and fertilize the earth to grow things, <coughs> they saw that as, you know, as a form of, you know, the gods were basically you know, getting together, right? And so they're showing them what to do, and that's um, and that's how paganism works. It's it, it has to do with manipulating the gods, trying to get them to do what you want. So if there's a drought, obviously the gods aren't doing what you, they need to do. So you go to the temple prostitutes and you pr show the gods what they need to be doing. Yeah, it all fall, it all boils down to uh, idolatry in general to trying to control God. So think about Eve in the Garden of Eden. When the serpent said, oh, when you eat from the tree, you will not die. And he says, you'll know everything, right? And then she thought, oh, this is great. I, I'll know good and evil. God's been holding back on me. So she wanted to play God. She wanted to know what God was trying to keep from her. And so uh, idolatry always falls into this categor category of trying to, to play God or to you know, manipulate God. Peter uh, continues in verse four by saying, they think it's strange that you do not plunge with them into the same flood of dissipation and they heap abuses on you. So he's talking about the people who, uh, the pagans who are the neighbors of these people who've converted to Christianity, uh, how they are being turned back uh, turned against by the people who continue to participate in these sinful things. Uh, you know, I guess it's easier to uh, cut yourself off from the rest of the world, you know, but the Bible does not say that Christians are supposed to, you know, to leave the world and to join like a small community so they can keep away from everybody. You know, that, that kind of protectionism is, you know, maybe it'll help you to stay uh, away from temptation, but that is not God's goal because what happens to the rest of the people? 
how are they going to learn about Jesus if you're not there to, to be a witness to your faith? So Christians are called to be in the world, but not of the world. You know, but we have lots of examples of Christian communities that do this, right? Like the Amish and the Mennonites and the Hutterites. There's a, these co communities that have formed in the United States over the last couple hundred years, and they're, they're enclaves of Christian communities that tr believe that they need to protect themselves from the rest of the world. But does that mean that there's no sin in the, among the Mennonites or the uh, Amish? No. It, humans are sinful, and because of that, um, you'll find sin in those communities. So it, it doesn't necessarily change things. Uh, but here, the fact that uh, pagans will think that you're strange because you don't join them in their dissipation, that, that means their, their sinfulness, the things that we just listed, and they'll heap abuses on you. Uh, think about our world today. People say, oh, you Christians are uh, you know, so intolerant, and you don't go uh, along with the things that everybody knows is okay, right? So, you know, our world says, you know, well, especially in the West, you know, sexuality is just splashed all over the media, right? Uh, you know, even other religions condemn that type of thing. It's, it's interesting that you know, Christianity says this is wrong, and, no, and people ignore it, but when the Muslim faith says, you know, that uh, women showing their skin publicly is, is, a, is an evil, nobody says that the, the Muslims are wrong for believing that. They believe it, and, you know, maybe they go further because then they ended up telling, uh, uh, treating women as if they're the source of evil, right? You know, when, when they talk about, in the Muslim faith, they say that they, they lift women up because they, they, they don't treat them like sex objects. Well, I don't think that's necessarily the problem because they keep them away from anything. It's a patriarchal society. Women can't make decisions. They can't you know, do anything. They're basically their husband's property in the, in the Muslim faith. But um, They couldn't even drive. Now they do it. That's right. Uh, uh, well, that's in one country particularly. Yeah. Saudi Arabia just, <laughs> just recently allowed women recently to start driving. Yeah. So you de definitely have um, different, maybe it's like a double standard when it comes to people in America, th the way that they look at different religions. So cr Christian religion, out of favor, so we, we get uh, attacked for, for different viewpoints. Other religions that may have the same or even more stringent viewpoints when it comes to morality, oh, that's okay because, you know, after all, we shouldn't be per uh, discriminating against other religions. <coughs> So Christians w will be attacked for doing what God's will is. And the reason is because the world is evil and God is good. And evil doesn't like good and won't accept it. So if you're going to be following God's will, you're going to be attacked. Um, in verse 5 he says, But they will ha have to give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. So you know, there's part of that verse that we get in the Apostles' Creed. Jesus will return to judge the living and the dead. So everything in the Apostles' Creed comes from the Bible. And so this, there's one of the verses that is, was used to, um, for that verse, uh, that part of the Apostles' Creed. Uh, so everybody will have to give an account. So people who attack Christians for doing God's will will be held accountable to that. You know, uh, The only way of uh, being able to not receive judgment is if our judgment is taken by Jesus, right? So when we stand before God, you know, as Christians we say, you know, um, my sins have been taken away by Jesus, so, you know, I, I'm allowed to come into heaven. So God pronounces us not guilty. But a person who says, I don't believe in Jesus, then God looks at them and says, so, uh, so why should I let you into heaven? And they say, oh, I did all these good things. And they say, but all your good deeds are like filthy rags. Like the book of Je uh, Jeremiah tells us that all our good deeds as humans are like filthy rags. We, we cannot do good in God's sight apart from trusting and putting our faith in God. And so when we reject Jesus, we reject salvation. And so that's what brings judgment upon a person. Uh, so he's talking about the people who are attacking Christians for doing God's will will be judged. And then as a Christian, we don't want people to just be judged. It's not our goal to save ourselves and to let everybody else go to hell. 
Verse 6, he says, For this is the reason the gospel was preached, even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to men in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. So he's talking about some of the people who had you know, already passed away since he was you know, preaching the gospel, right? So he, he wanted as many people as possible to know about Jesus. So when it talks about the gospel, the word gospel simply means good news, right? And so it, that's shorthand for the good news of Jesus Christ who suffered, died, and rose again for the forgiveness of our sins. So uh, when we know that Jesus is the one who did all, all this for us, then there is a possibility of putting our faith in him and to be saved. Uh, so Peter, as one of the, you know, the disciples, was called by Jesus to go ahead and share the good news. So that's what his reason was, to go out. And he preached, and he says, to those who are now dead. Um, he's talking about something that had happened in, throughout his life. It was all in the, it's up to this point. So he's talking about his past calling. Um, and so he, he's not talking about preaching to people who were already dead, but people who had died bef you know, since he started preaching. Uh, they had their chance, and the whole point is, is that God gives, pe gives everybody a chance, right? And I, I guess sometimes we could come up with a scenario, like maybe, you know, I, I've read about people who are like the tribes in Bra the Brazilian rainforests who have never met another you know, uh, person outside of, they've seen other people, but they've never c talked to other people outside of their, uh, do they know who Jesus is? Probably not. Does that mean that they can't go to heaven? Well, I would say that the answer to that question is, it's so theoretical, we, the only thing we can do is say, um, that's not our job to decide, right? We leave that in God's hands. You know, God, and the Bible's clear that God has given evidence of his existence to the world. If people choose to trust in God or not, they'll be judged according to what God has given them. So we have a conscience. We know that certain things are wrong. When we sin against our conscience, we bring condemnation upon ourselves, unless we ask for forgiveness. So I, you know, I don't necessarily know um, what the answer is. As Christians, we are to preach the gospel to people so that they know how to receive forgiveness. And if a person ever hears that, what does God do? Well, you know, God doesn't give us the answer to that. Nowadays, so many missionaries that they go to those places and preach. Huh? Right. There are a lot of missionaries. But the thing is that there are still cultures that speak languages that the Bible has never been translated into. And so unless somebody can learn the language and to preach to those people, there's, there are thousands of languages. And in the world, there are still, I don't know how many there would be, but I would, I, I'm sure there, there are still hundreds of languages where the Bible has never been translated and missionaries don't necessarily know those languages yet. So there's still people who don't know Jesus in their own language. Uh, so definitely that's our goal as Christians is to continue to carry out what Peter was given by Jesus to do, to preach the good news. Uh, and so he's talking here about so that they might be judged according to men in regard to the body. So... That is, you know, uh, as humans, we're sinners, and our bodies will die as a result of sin. But then notice the second part says, but to live according to God in regards to the spirit. So even though our bodies will die, the Bible never says, oh, if you believe in Jesus, you'll never die. It does say you'll never die for, through faith in Christ. And Jesus says in John 11, says, even if he says, if you believe in me, even though you die, yet you shall live. So we know he's talking about a, a different type of life. We're not just, your sinful body will die, but then you'll be raised again to new life. So that's what the word resurrection means. To resurrect means to, to be brought back to life again, right? The, the first two letters, R-E, re, means again. So to be resuscitated, to have a spiritual um, a second chance. And so God, that's what's, uh, that is the only hope for sinful human beings that will die because of, our, uh, because of the original sin that was brought into the world through Adam and Eve. Uh, so by talking about judgment and the hope of salvation that comes through uh, the gospel, you know, he, he's just summarizing in a short 
couple of sentences, you know, what he has been doing and what God wants to do uh, among people. And then verse 7, he jumps into, why do we need to do this now? Well, because the end is close, right? He says in verse 7, the end of all things is near. Now, here it's been 2,000 years since Peter wrote this, but, you know, near is a relative term. I mean, and God's, and, and, and when you look at all of eternity, you know, Jesus' return is a lot nearer than the, the rest of existence, right? Time is, you know, goes on and on, but um, 2,000 years is still short in God's eyes, right? So uh, God has a purpose for waiting, and his purpose has to do with bringing more people to salvation. So even though Peter, if he, you know, to, to walk into this room today and say, well, when I wrote this, I thought Jesus was coming next year, but he didn't, um, you know, I don't think that he would have necessarily changed the way he wanted to write it because the whole point is every generation that reads this needs to have the same understanding. Jesus could be here any time. How do we live our lives? I th this is actually in my sermon last Sunday. Remember I, s I said um, that w one of the ways that we live our faith out is to live as if uh, we would, yeah, that Jesus would return tomorrow. You know, if we were going to die tomorrow, how would we live differently? If we, this is our last day on earth, how would we live? <clears throat> so our faith is, uh, is awakened and it is, goes into action when we have that type of attitude. Tomorrow might be the, my last day. How am I going to live today? So he, so he makes that statement and then he goes into some of the, um, into some of the, uh, practical applications for how do you live when the end is near. He says, therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. So as Christians, to be clear-minded means, you know, don't let all kinds of things uh, fill your mind. Don't, don't get distracted, right? And this, more than any other time in history, I think, I was reading about uh, the difference between, like, the Reformation and today. I, th I think it was in our Lutheran Witness is a magazine for the Lutheran Church. It said back in the 1500s, the the big question was how do you get, how are you saved? The Catholic Church was teaching you're saved by good works, and then Luther found in by in the Bible you're saved by your faith, right? And that's what the Bible says. That was the big issue. Now, and you know, one of the issues is you know people you don't even believe in the existence of God, or you know, and science is ruling. And back then, they hardly had, they, they had um, very little information. Christians didn't have their own Bibles. They had to just go to church and hear what the pastors would say. But now, we are inundated with so much information. People kind of, they just say, oh, it's too much information. I don't want to listen to any of it, right? So back then, people didn't have access to the gospel. Now, people have access to it, but it's flooded out by so much stuff that it's hard to hear it. So, you know, are we better or worse off than they were then? You know, I... I would say that it's different problems, but the same issues. People need to have their minds cleared, and as a Christian, we call on the Holy Spirit because self-control is one of the fruits of the Spirit. Remember Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23. The last ver part of the verse in verse 23 says, you know, that um, the fruit of the Spirit is, he starts out with love, and there's nine uh, fruits of the Spirit, and then the last one is, and self-control. So Peter here is, is calling on us as Christians to prepare for the end when Jesus will return by making sure our minds aren't cluttered with other stuff, thinking about Jesus and focusing on him, and have the self-control, which uh, allows us to, to do what is necessary as Christians. So what's necessary? He says to pray, right? So that you can pray. Instead of... Um, Focusing on the earthly things, our prayers can be focused on, I mean, not that God doesn't want us to. I mean, in the, even in the Lord's Prayer, we say, give us this day our daily bread. But in the Lord's Prayer, there's, there's like seven different petitions or asking, things you're asking for. You know, you're asking that God's will be done. You're asking for your forgiveness of your sins, not leading into temptation. But notice that of the seven things that are listed in the Lord's Prayer, only one is about physical needs, your daily bread. And the other, there's three in the, in the beginning, asking for spiritual blessings. God's will be done uh, on earth as is in heaven and his kingdom come. And then three, spiritual protections. So 
there's six spiritual things you're praying for and only one physical thing. So as Christians, if we were to follow Jesus' example, the whole point of being self-controlled is so that we can pray. Are we praying for the spiritual things? You know, we should be praying for spiritual blessings and for spiritual protections. Uh, and then he says in verse 8, you know, really this is the, um, you know, the, the meaning or the, the goal of Christianity. He says, above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Uh, is it possible to love each other deeply? Well, through the power of the Holy Spirit, you know, we can. And uh, that deep love means that we want what's best eternally for other people. So if you desire the eternal uh, benefits for other people, that means, you know, it doesn't mean you have to like everything that they do or that you agree with everything. You know, we have, to, people have different political views, but that doesn't mean we can't love each other. And so uh, when we love each other, what that does is covers over a multitude of sins. You know, uh, when you love somebody, if they do something you don't like, love allows you to forgive them. Love allows you to accept them. And it helps to heal, uh, you know, the rifts that happen when, we, uh, when people have differences of opinion or when they sin against each other. Okay, so it's all about love because that is the epitome of the Christian life. Uh, so he's giving us kind of a list of practical things. We should be clear-minded and self-controlled so that we can pray. We should love uh, other, uh, each other because love is, you know, that important ingredient that allows community to exist. In verse 9, he says, Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Um, why should we offer hospitality? And he says to each other. He's talking to the Christian community. You know, I think we might say, um, you know, oh, as a Christian, sure, I'm going to take care of my family, but what about other people outside of your family? Well, hospitality is just not expecting anything in return. You care for sojourners, people who are traveling, people who are in need, right? So when Jesus talked about who is our neighbor, he used the parable of the Good Samaritan. And, and he says to the, the question wa was by the young man, he says, who is my neighbor? So Jesus gives a parable, and then at the end of the parable, he talks about how the man was beaten up by robbers, and these three people passed him, right? The, the Levite and the priest, and then the Samaritan passed him, and the Samaritan helped him. And Jesus' question to, to the young man was, who was a neighbor to the man beaten up by the robbers? That's right. It was the Samaritan. So it was the one who helped. So Jesus doesn't answer the question by saying, who is my neighbor? He's, he answers the question by saying, who am I a neighbor to? You become a neighbor to somebody when you care for them. And as that's our goal. We're not, so to offer hospitality to another person is to be neighborly, is to care for people in need. Doesn't mean we, care for, we have to like pour out all our money to help everybody because we can't solve the problems of poverty. But we can help the individuals who are in our path, the people who are in need right in front of us. I mean, God brings uh, us together to help the people who we see right in front of us. Uh, you know, maybe um, uh, if a Christian is grumbling about something, it's not, well, it's a sin because it's Believing that maybe you've given too much or you don't you won't have enough. It's this idea. Oh, I'm gonna lose something But God will always provide for you. So you can't outgive God We can give to other people knowing that God will always provide for what we need In Verse 10 he says each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others So this is talking about stewardship. How do we use the things God has given us? We should use it to serve others and he says, faithfully administering God's grace in his various forms. S uh, so as Peter is talking about the, um, these different gifts that we have or these different callings as Christians, uh, talking about loving each other and hospitality and stuff like that, uh, in verse 10 when he says, each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, uh, remember that's sim very similar to Paul's description in both Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 about how uh, as the body of Christ we each have a, a, a gift or a calling uh, or the gifts of the spirit so um, the gifts of service and leadership 
and uh, compassion and generosity. So some of these things are really just examples of those lists there. But here he just summarizes it by saying, whatever gift you have, use it for service, right? So as Christians, we are to serve each other because if, if we're part of the body of Christ, you know, the body works together and helps each other. So we have a purpose as members of this church and of the Christian church throughout the whole world to be there for each other. Uh, and so he says that we should be faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. You know, think about God's grace is, I, sometimes I use the description, the grace is like a, a present, and in, inside of it are all kinds of stuff. So God's grace is the, is the present that incorporates all the other stuff. So if you open up a present, inside of this gift of God's grace is, is forgiveness of sins, life, salvation, um, you know, being part of the body of Christ, being loved by other people, supported by the power of the Holy Spirit. All these things are part of God's grace. A lot of times we experience grace through other people, right? So when we show love to others, they're experiencing God's grace through us. And uh, in verse 11, he says, If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. Uh, that doesn't mean that everybody who speaks is going to be preaching, but you should think about if I'm pr talking to somebody, is it something I would be ashamed of? Or is it something that reflects a good witness to what Jesus has said? So we should speak to others out of love, uh, with encouragement, without negativity, right? And he goes on to say, if anyone serves, he should do it with, with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. So it almost sounds like he ends it right there. I mean, he could have ended the, the um, letter there. But instead, he's just ending that section. He's going to go on with a couple more final categories of uh, topics. But um, uh, when we serve, you know, earlier he said, don't, don't serve um, by grumbling. He's, he talks about, uh, in verse 9, offer hospitality without grumbling. Here, this is the same type of thing. Is if you're going to serve, since God has given you different gifts, don't do it with the expectation, oh, if, I, if people don't appreciate what I'm doing, then I'm not going to do this anymore. Because then your, your attitude is... Don't expect blessings. So you don't yeah. Expect I, you know, I would say that Christians should sh be show thanksgiving and, and love to each other, right? So it's a sad state of affairs if somebody does something and you don't, you know, we're not saying thank you. But our reason for serving isn't to get thanks from people, but it is to glorify God. Um, but I think a healthy Christian body is going to show love and support to those who are serving and to those who need to be served, right? So we serve people out of love and we show our thanksgiving